Um, this is a very nice um, opportunity. Thank you for inviting me because um, I spent uh, ooh, best part of 20 years in business in China, at least 16, I think we did, um, running a market research company, which I actually co-founded with um, a good friend, a man called Matthew Crabb, who studied Chinese here at uh, Leeds University in the 1980s. And, and, and all of those, many, over the years, many, many people that cycled through our firm, either working for us or as clients, were all part of what used to be known as the Leeds Mafia, which was um, everyone who had sort of learned Chinese in, in the department at Leeds and then ended up keeping those connections when they went out to China, usually in Beijing or Shanghai, though the, that mafia does have branches down in Guangzhou and, uh, and um, Hong Kong as well, and all over. Um, so Leeds was always a part of um, my, my Chinese life. We decided that we would do market research because what do you do really when you don't really have many other skills except writing essays and, and speaking a bit of Chinese? Um, or you try and find a job that involves speaking a bit of Chinese and writing essays, which is really market research. Um, so, so we kind of did that and we decided that um, lots of people were setting up market research businesses. China didn't really have market research in the 1990s. Um, uh, it was something that foreign companies particularly needed and foreign governments needed as well for their kind of organizations like the China Britain Business Council or the US State Department or so on. Lots of people wanted to get into lots of different businesses. We had some friends, for instance, who set up a market research company looking at coal and coal mining. But I thought that's not really for me. One, uh, you know, I just sort of thought like if you go down one coal mine, you've been down every coal mine as far as I could see. So um, we thought, what should we do that would be more interesting? And we thought we'd do retail and consumers. Now, in the 1990s, that looks like a good idea now. In the 1990s, um, no one uh, really thought that the retail business would ever take off and be significant in China. And no one thought that the consumer economy was ever going to be particularly interesting in China. They thought that everyone was too poor. Uh, no, there wasn't enough of a middle class. Uh, there just wasn't the infrastructure for um, modern retailing. Um, that turned out to be wrong. And of course, by the end of that decade, the Chinese consumer and Chinese retail had become really the most compelling retail and consumer story in the world at that time and remains so for quite a long time, up until very recently when it became less of an interesting story. Um, but that did very well for us because, of course, everybody wanted to know about it. All the retailers that wanted to get into the market wanted to know about it from the big supermarket chains, the, the Carrefour's, the, the Tesco's, uh, all of those, as well as all of the brands, the high street brands, uh, from Next to Marks and Spencers, thinking of UK brands, but Zara, Gap, all of those, through to, of course, the high-end luxury brands from Louis Vuitton, Gucci, Chanel, all of the French, Italian, and occasionally British luxury brands. So it was a very, very busy time um, from about the mid-1990s through to kind of 2012, 2013. Um, and, and everyone wanted to know uh, about everything. And it was, of course, rolling out across the country. It started off in Beijing and Shanghai, but it rolled out very quickly to tier two, tier three. And before we knew it, I mean, you know, before the 90s were out, we were opening uh, flagship Louis Vuitton stores in Chengdu and places that, you know, just a few years before we wouldn't have imagined that we were selling. The market then got even better, if you like, because the Chinese started traveling abroad. And so what we were also doing was opening stores and trying to analyze consumers because so much of what we had in China, due to very high taxes, particularly on luxury goods, uh, were really just shop windows for all the Chinese that were going to Bond Street or Fifth Avenue or down to Singapore or Hong Kong or wherever to buy the luxury goods tax-free and take them home. Um, but you still had to have the store in China. You had to, you had to win the consumer in China to make them shop when they got down to Hong Kong or London or wherever they were going. Um, so the story just got slightly better. And then we had, of course, a lot of the rise of a lot of Chinese retail brands that learned an awful lot, of course, from the Western brands coming in converted that slightly and, and became great hits themselves. And finally, uh, for us anyway, it was a good market because so many of these companies listed. And so, of course, we suddenly had the merchant banks, or what are now called investment banks, um, wanting to get in on the action and trade shares, buy into those companies, come up to China, have a look around. And so for many years, every week was spent hosting groups from New York, London, Paris, wherever, who just wanted to go around and, as they would say, kick the tires 
have a look at these Chinese retailers, have a look at what people were doing. All those big consumer plays that had a China element at the time, Kentucky Fried Chicken, McDonald's, Carrefour. I mean, you know, you, you know all of those uh, stories. So all of that was very interesting. And then uh, I was always very interested in what the foreign experience in China had been before, before the revolution in 1949, back before the Second World War, and was writing a lot about that as well. And then fortunately, the China consumer story became so uh, exciting, and we had been doing it for so long, that by dint of just getting older, um, we became um, quite well known. And um, eventually, uh, around 2013, a larger global well, English actually, but global market research company called Mintel came in and they bought us. So that was very nice. And um, that was the end of that for me. And I've been able to get involved in other businesses since, mostly in the creative industries, publishing, film and television and so on. Um, But always with an eye on what was going on. But I haven't really had to think about business in China for a little while, also because of COVID and everything. No one's really been thinking much about business anywhere. So um, it's nice to sort of have this opportunity to go back and look at a few things. And at start at the end of last year, the China Project, which is a New York-based subscription service that provides uh, lots of excellent information and tracking services on, on China, um, came to me and we talked about doing a column. And I said, well, let's just do the best books on China. Let's imagine you wanted to have the shelf of just the best books that have ever been written on China by foreign authors, by Chinese authors by whoever, and we'll go back and we'll look at them. And this is the shelf you should have if you want to understand China. It will be the ultimate shelf. So to start the shelf, I started with basically my hero, who is this man, Carl Crow. And Carl Crow is kind of fascinating. He came to, he's from Missouri. He went to Missouri Journalism School and he became a newspaper man at first. And he came to Shanghai in 1911. He arrived three months before the Xinhai, before the uh, Republican Revolution of 1911 of Dr. Sun Yat-sen. Um, and he encompasses pretty much every kind of foreign experience in China that you can imagine. The first one being the instant expert, right? So he arrives three months before a revolution takes place. He's never been to China before. He's never really thought about China before. He's received a job offer to go and work on an English language newspaper in the international settlement at that time of Shanghai. And he goes, and um, a revolution happens, and he's told that he has to go and cover it. So, of course, he has to sound knowledgeable, and he has to start writing articles that make it sound as if he understands what's going on in in uh, Wuhan and, and Nanjing and elsewhere where, where the um, revolution is breaking out and the republic is being formed. And, of course, this is an enormous story. 267-year-old Qing dynasty is, is collapsing. It's finishing. A new republic is coming. Crow is a... a from a young republic himself, from the United States of America, he identifies with uh, with what's going on. But he doesn't necessarily admit, he admits that he doesn't quite know what's going on, but still he has to write about it. And we've sort of had that ever since with having to sort of play catch up on events in China. You can see him roughly in 1911 when he first arrived. Um, then you can see him round about kind of um, nine, late 1920s, uh, after he'd been in Shanghai for quite a while. He then left journalism and set up the first well, or the second, really, uh, but certainly the biggest um, Western-style advertising agency in China. So when you go to Shanghai, you'll know uh, uh, Yuan Peifai, the um, Calendar Girl posters and so on. Much of those were produced by Carl Crow's uh, company. And of course, every retro coffee shop in Shanghai and everywhere still has those those posters everywhere of sort of beautiful Chinese women, Chong San, Chi Pao, and then kind of, you know, selling Western products, cosmetics or or, or whatever. And he was kind of very influential in that. And then here he is, uh, actually, after he'd left China uh, 1945, um, uh, after he had become a well-known author and so on. And I'll explain a little bit of his story. But you can see here some of the advertising that he was doing back in the 1920s. So again, my big theme, I guess, today, if there is one, is uh, particularly for, for foreigners in China and foreigners doing business in China is that we have made many, many mistakes in China because we have lacked a collective memory of our own experiences in China. So there are a whole lot of, there's really three phases of sort of foreign business in China, if you like. I mean, the first one is kind of the 19th century. And I won't talk about that one because, you know, it's not that instructive nowadays. And we know how it ended, right? It ended with us trying to sell opium 
with the Chinese not wanting the opium, with us having a war, and uh, you know, it ending very violently with the establishment of colonies and semi-colonial treaty ports and so on. But the second phase of kind of foreign business in China was really the 1920s and 30s, the period that Carl Crow was working in. Um, and he was selling all of these Western products. You can see Bourneville Coca here. He's an American, but obviously Bourneville, Birmingham. And he's representing them. He's also putting up advertising. He controls these billboards, which are very interesting because, of course, they're just like billboards anywhere else in the world, except he's put these little Chinese eaved roofs on them and everything, which make them rather, uh, rather pretty and, and uh, quite well um, established. He had these all the way from Shanghai running right up the Yangtze, um, almost as far by the time um, the Japanese invaded. He'd managed to get these billboards as far as Chongqing, um, certainly all the way up through <clears throat> certainly in Nanjing uh, and, and further up the Yangtze. Many, many um, spots that he had all over the country. And Chinese companies would obviously pay to be on these billboards as well. You can see various Chinese cigarette brands there as well. So he's using the technologies of his time, billboards and so on, lots of newspaper advertising, uh, and um, he's promoting foreign brands in China. So he has a really good understanding of how successful or not successful foreign brands are doing in China. Now, the thing about uh, Crow is that he committed one of the great sins of the foreign businessman in China. If there is a great sin of the foreign businessman in China, it is to admit that you lost money. Nobody ever wants to admit that they lost money in China. Yet vast numbers of foreign businesses that have gone to China have, of course, lost vast amounts of money in China um, when they're trying to sell to the Chinese consumer. Now. Carl, even in the 1930s, was very clear that, that perhaps there would be a market for manufacturing in China. And indeed, of course, we know that later on there was an enormous market for manufacturing in China. It became the world's workshop. But that was many decades later. Um, what he was questioning was the idea that China was this enormous market and that every product you threw at the Chinese, they would buy it because it was Western, because it was good, even if the quality was better than something they didn't, they had already, they would still buy it because it was Western. This was just believed, whether it was pharmaceuticals, cosmetics, cars, uh, whatever the product was, cigarettes, um, the Chinese would, would buy it. Um, so he uh, decided that this actually wasn't true in his experience, that in fact, most of his clients had lost money. And his clients raised, raised from uh, Colgate toothpaste, you know, Kodak camera film, I mean, many, many different companies, beer companies, Scotch whiskey companies. Most of them never really made any money in China. And he decided to write a book trying to work out why this was and what was the illusions that we were suffering under as foreign business people in China that made us think we were going to make money, but we actually didn't make money. And he wrote this book, 400 million customers. And you have to remember that 400 million sounded like an enormous number for China at that time. And this number had been bouncing around for a long time. Whenever anyone talked about China in the 1930s, they would say the 400 million Chinese. Wow, 400 million people. Of course, it is a big number, but not such a big number as now. And it's questionable where that number came from, which I'll talk about in a minute. And he wrote this book, 400 Million Customers, The Hilarious Startling Adventures of a Yankee Ad Man in Old China. There are different subtitles to it, but that's one of them. And it was a bestseller all around the world, everywhere. You can see here many different editions. The one in green on the, on the side there is actually one that was published in Germany. There's one there in Dutch, uh, Hungarian, I think, Romanian. I mean, I just pulled a selection of them off. He sold an incredible number of translations. The book came out in 1937. It was a disastrous time, really, for a book to come out. It came out just shortly before the Japanese attack on Beijing and Shanghai in the summer of 1937. And it blew apart this myth that everyone had been making lots of money in China. And it blew apart this myth as well that um, China was, um, that, that Japan was not aggressive towards China. These were the two things that got him into all sorts of trouble. So if you look at the reviews at the time, there are lots of people who aren't really involved in business in China who think this is just one of the most interesting stories they've ever read. And everyone wants a copy of this book in all different languages. But he's also got lots of foreign business people who have been telling their bosses back home that they're making money or explaining why they're not making money, but will make vast amounts of money next quarter or next year. 
Um, they're not so happy about this book. And he also gets a letter from the uh, US consulate in Shanghai saying, dear Mr. Crow, and remember, this is, this is by now, um, June 1937. Dear Mr. Crow, please, dear Mr. Crow, please, will you, um, stop talking about, uh, the Japanese being aggressive? Do you not know that they are our allies? Do you not know that we trade a lot with Japan? And this is not the view of our consulate in Shanghai. Well, of course, a month, six weeks later, the Japanese were bombing Shanghai. They were bombing and taking over Beijing and Tianjin. And of course, Carl was proved right and the consulate was proved wrong. Anyway, in this book, he writes, so long as people of one country make goods to sell to others, so long as ships cross the ocean and international trade exists, the golden illusion of the sales which may be made to China's industrious millions will always be an intriguing one. No matter what you may be selling, your business in China should be enormous. If the Chinese who should buy your goods would only do so. And this was the problem. How do you get Chinese people to buy what you wanted people to buy? It goes on. At one time or another, almost every conceivable kind of merchandise has been shipped to China on the off chance that some use would be found for it and that a market would be built up. And the problem, as Carl identified it, and this again is something that, you know, we have to think about again when we get to the 1990s and 2000s, and again, when we think about business now, such as it exists with China, is these projections that are made on theoretical customers, the magic 400 million customers that, of course, are not uh, really in existence. There was theoretical customers, projections based on small urban elites, particularly in Shanghai at that time, who, who, who were buying things. Um, in markets like cosmetics, Western cosmetics, wine, um, cars, uh, there were very small groups of urban consumers and they were projecting those numbers onto the wider society of China. So overcapacity became uh, a massive problem. Pharmaceuticals is one example he talks about in this book. Um, uh, China in the 1930s had just 25,000 hospital beds for 400 million people. So he never launched a single successful pharmaceutical in China at that time. And of course, we can parallel that to um, also the problems when they did get them out there with copycats, lookalikes, fakes, and so on. We've seen that again and again and again with everything from ibuprofen to, to Viagra, right? We've seen it with every product being kind of bootlegged in China, uh, intellectual property being an absolute nightmare for us. With um, cosmetics and toiletries and those kind of products, which were largely new uh, to China in, in, in their modern forms. Um, they were often faked and imitated by um, local brands, um, which, of course, we saw again in the 1990s when brands like Pantene Shampoo and so on went into China. They were instantly faked with lookalike brands, lookalike names, kind of copycat brands that were always, of course, priced much, much lower than, than the Western equivalent. Um, Retailers uh, in China working with local manufacturers was always a great difficulty in the 1930s and became even more of a difficulty in the 1990s and early 2000s when so many electronic goods were coming into the, the country. Think of washing machines and so on. So um, uh, local brands could always go lower on price than, than the foreign brands. Um, and then retailers, and, and you know, you'll know if you've ever sort of shopped for electronic white goods, if you like washing machines or dishwashers or something in China, you'll know that it's a volume game in China. It's about very low prices. It's about selling as many as possible, which made it very hard for the likes of brands that were trying to get in at the time, like Whirlpool, Siemens, um, to do anything um, and get knocked out of the picture and would end up sort of in the corner of the store gathering dust. Um, so, so there was lots of, um, uh, problems that were going on. And Crow saw the market, which is a great description, I think, of the market in the 1930s, but also the Chinese market in uh, the 1990s and two, early 2000s. He described it as one of long receivables, rigid markets, structural inefficiencies, impossible logistics, relentless brazen copying and substitution of imported goods with fakes. Um, there was, of course, price wars. 
prices tumbling all the time that made things even tougher. This was still the case in the sort of third iteration of foreign business in China. When I was looking for companies at how you got a product, say, from the docks at Shanghai to uh, Chongqing, for instance, they were often what we in the logistics business would call kind of three-step transactions, right? So it came off the dock and then it had to go on and off something at least two or three times. And this, of course, is always a problem because that adds to the amount of breakage you have. It has, you know, if it's in bottles, bottles get broken, things get dropped, food spoils. We still lacked uh, refrigerated transportation and there were structural inefficiencies as well. For instance, until quite recently and still in a lot of cases in China, if you needed a truck to go um, across China, it was always problematic because the insurance system in China it's the sort of thing you wouldn't think of when you first enter the market. The insurance system in China only allowed truck drivers to be insured by province. So you could take something out of Shanghai and the truck driver was fine. He could maybe go into Jiangsu and he was okay. But then he'd hit the border with the next province up and he didn't have any insurance anymore. So everything had to come off the truck and everything had to go on to another truck that had insurance. So nationwide insurance um, was a big problem. In fact, actually, we saw this still being a problem in COVID with the um, truck drivers in China getting stuck for long periods because they didn't necessarily have the right paperwork and insurance and so on to, to go in and out of different provinces at the same time. Um, so, so that was still a, a problem that went on that Crow identified in the 30s that we got away. Um, he also talked about one that I got burnt on quite a number of times, which was um, giveaways. Um, you are very brave, I would say now, and you've had Crow to learn from, and you've had, had the experience of people like me in the 1990s and 2000s to learn from, if you do free giveaways in China. You absolutely, I mean, the government doesn't even like you doing free giveaways because the police know that there's likely to be a riot whenever you do it. It's one of the reasons why even in big cities, you used to have one renminbi sachets of, of uh, shampoo, which, we, which, you know, was partly to do with cost sensitiveness and taste trial, but we would also have to charge a price for them Whereas in the West, we might have just given those away in order to try and win the branding. But it would end up with um, with riots. I can remember when um, Carrefour uh, in Shanghai decided to do free breakfasts. And the amount of people that turned up for the free breakfast at 7 o'clock in the morning was so much that the whole windows of the front of Carrefour were, were wobbling backwards and forwards with people wanting to push in. Starbucks have had, have had similar problems over the years with things like that. So free samples um, are very, very rare. And also promotions that work here or America don't necessarily work in China. The Chinese consumer thinks of things differently. And again, Crow identified some of these differences. Um, and I can tell you, I'll give you an example of one that, one that he sort of experienced that we then experienced as well was um, a, a very traditional thing that you would do here. There's an American retailer called Athlete's Foot that sells trainers. I mean, that's a sort of a funny name to the English because Athlete's Foot is a sort of a disease of the, the feet in this country. But in America, it was a very successful train, chain selling uh, trainers. And they did what's called a bog off. And the bog off is buy one, get one free. Right? So the idea was you come into the store. And you bring your wife or your ch children, your child in those days, and you come into the store and uh, you buy yourself a nice pair of trainers, Adidas, Nike, whatever. And then you buy your wife a pair of trainers, right? And you buy one and you get one free, right? That's a pretty good deal. When it's done, it usually is very successful in, in the UK or America when it's done to clear inventory, to move things through, to win loyalty from the customer. And so, of course, they thought, let's do this in Shanghai. Let's do this in China. It'll build loyalty to the brand. It's a good bargain for everyone. And we'll sell a lot of trainers, which they wanted to do because the trainers were being made in China. So it was a good thing to do. So off they go. And they launched this uh, bog off promotion. Buy one, get one free. It's in the window of every store. It's advertised in the newspapers. It's advertised on the television, the radio, everywhere. The first thing that happens perplexes the foreign brand completely, which is there is a queue of people queuing up to buy one pair of trainers. When they get to the cash till, they put the box of trainers down. The cousin says, are these okay? Do you want these? Yeah. And they say to them, I don't know, I'll invent a price. 
500 renminbi. And they say, no, 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 surely they're 250 renminbi, right? Because you buy one, you get one free. So if you buy one and you get one free, if you just buy one, that should be half price, right? Now, this, of course, made total sense to the Chinese consumer. And of course, it, it does make a certain sort of sense if you're not familiar with bog off promotions. But of course, the retailer just could not understand this. They're like, no, 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 no. What you're supposed to do is buy another pair of shoes. And then, you know, you'll get both pairs for 500 renminbi. But this was totally understandable. So what happened was people got really annoyed when they weren't allowed to get the shoes for 250 renminbi. They threw them down on the floor. They stormed outside the shop. And of course, they had one of these very great, big, sort of, you know, quite angry uh, demonstrations outside the shop saying the foreign brand is cheating us. It says we buy one, get one free. So if we buy one, get one free, if I buy one, it should be 50% off, shouldn't it? Everyone says, yes, of course it should. Except the retailer says, no, 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 that's not how it works. Well, it was the most disastrous thing for athletes. Foot. They ended up uh, having a complete disaster with that one. Similar things have always happened as well with um, giveaways and taste testing. Um, we, um, we had one which was um, a very famous one in the 90s. And Carl again talks about, you know, giving things away uh, and, and trying to, um, one of the things that he did was he tried to, uh, within newspapers, he tried to put free magazines within newspapers that advertise things. Except that it was such a disaster because, of course, in China in the 1930s, and you will have still seen this up until quite regularly in China, you would get the old aunties going around the streets collecting as much waste paper as they could to take to the recycling place where they would get a little bit of money to take it back. And the mistake he made was that at a certain point, the money you got for the recycled newspaper was more than the cost of the newspaper, right? So if they paid two fun or 50 fun for the newspaper and the recycling guy, based on weight, gave them one room and B for it, of course, what they did was just go and buy every newspaper they could in town, take it, didn't read it, took it straight to the recycling person, got the money and went away. Nobody ever saw the advert. The disastrous one that I remember uh, from Shanghai in the 90s was when Hershey's was trying to push into China. I mean, Hershey's the American chocolate brand. Now, if you've ever tasted Hershey's, you'll know that it's um, perhaps not the best chocolate in the world uh, to, to, to our European tastes. But uh, or, or, and it certainly it wasn't necessarily to Chinese tastes. But what they did was they thought that, well, what's the most successful American brand in China at the moment? And at that time, it was without a doubt KFC. KFC were killing it in China, selling their kind of uh, chicken. This is always slightly amazing because the, if you give the Chinese chicken, they can fry chicken absolutely perfectly and it tastes wonderful. And yet so many people chose to eat KFC. This is always one of the great mysteries that not even Carl Pro or me can explain. So what they decided to do was, if KFC is doing really, really well, we will give everyone who goes to KFC a free Hershey's kiss, right? Which is a little small Hershey's uh, sweet. Now, the problem there was that at the same time they did that, which of course KFC was quite happy with, yeah, drop off the candy. We'll just give it away. It's like a free thing from KFC. It looks wonderful for KFC. But they were at the time trying to, as they have very successfully, localize their product and making their chicken burger much, much more spicy, right? really spicy compared to what you would get in KFC here or America. And um, so people bought this. And you had, of course, Pepsi were in on the deal with KFC as well, as they are everywhere. So people ate a spicy chicken burger and they drank a great big cup of Pepsi Cola. And after that, they ate a Hershey's kiss. Now, if you try to eat a piece of chocolate after you've had a really spicy chicken burger and you've drunk like a big gulp of Pepsi Cola, it tastes disgusting, regardless of whether or not it's good or bad chocolate. It's going to taste horrible. You're going to feel sick. And that's what happened. So, of course, again, it was that was a massive fail. But, of course, it looked good because they thought they were going to get Hershey's into the hands of everyone who was eating KFC in China, which was at that time about 400 million people. So it was kind of um, another thing that went completely wrong. Um, so these again are just because we've lost 
over that time from the 1930s when foreign business left China to the sort of 1980s when foreign business came back, there was this great time, you know, when the bamboo curtain came down and so on, where we just didn't know what was going on in China. But Carl Crow taught it all to us. It was, it was all there. We just decided not to read it. He, this is cartoons that were done by a uh, Russian emigre cartoonist that was in Shanghai who worked for Crow at the time. This one here shows that he's trying to stress how fashionable the Shanghai woman is, that you don't need to give the Shanghai woman lessons on fashion, right? You don't necessarily need to sell them clothes. What you need to sell them, as you can see from the hairstyles, is permanent wave kits to give them perhaps curly hair, cosmetics for the face, lipstick, things like this you can sell. So when you look at those calendar girl adverts that are so famous in Shanghai, you see the... um you see the uh, 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 woman in a very traditional uh, costume, although, of course, over time, and Carl claimed, uh, um, claimed credit for this, the slit on the um, chipao gets a little bit higher, a little bit higher, a little bit higher, gets a bit more risque, a bit more sexy all the time. Um, but what he's really trying to sell is products for the hair, shampoo, lipstick, cosmetics, and so on. But with that, the other one, of course, was... That age-old uh, trope that he was, which is still kind of true, unfortunately. Like, I mean, the problem with working in retail and consumer is many things that we would say are stere stereotypical often are actually true, so we can use them. And of course, the stereotypical one of the Shanghai woman, who um, of course makes sure that her husband does everything for her, and um, always has servants uh, looking after things, and that Shanghai women don't really um, do very much themselves. So the idea that you could sell Shanghai women brushes or brooms or, or kitchen appliances was no good. You can see a Western woman there is very happily cooking her husband dinner and everything. But a Shanghai woman, of course, has someone who does that for her. So trying to sell her that. That was still true in the 90s and 2000s. When we were trying, at first of all, to sell washing machines in China, um, it was very, very difficult for us to sell washing machines. We would go in with German brands that looked like spaceships, right? They had everything on the front of them, Mi millions of different washes. They could do everything. And of course, front loaders, you know, what we call a front loading machine. And all China wanted was cheap, cheap, cheap top loaders. Didn't matter if people had more money. Didn't matter if they were middle class. Didn't matter if they were taking advantage of the new property laws and buying themselves apartments. Very rarely did the woman of the house ever use the washing machine. It was the I that used the washing machine. And you're not going to spend a lot of money on something your IE uses, right? You're going to spend the money on a flat screen TV. You're going to spend the money on a computer console. You're going to spend it on video games, things that people can see. You're going to spend it on a car. You're not going to spend it on kitchen appliances because rarely did anyone go in the kitchen. Rarely did people entertain at home. I mean, the Chinese concept of the dinner party is you take people to a restaurant rather than usually to your home and so on. So. These things just didn't work. And also lack of space. Even wealthy people, the new middle class in the cities, did not have large apartments, do not have large apartments. So top loaders were much more practical than front loading washing machines. And so, of course, the cheap as chips, Chinese brands sold lots and lots, volume sales, volume sales, volume sales. And of course, you know, the European brands, the American brands with all these undoubtedly, arguably better machines, better for your clothes as well. Couldn't, couldn't shift them, couldn't sell them, didn't matter. Price was not the issue. It's also worthwhile saying that Chinese people were always considered in the 1930s by Crow and still by, this is another mistake that foreign businesses still make, that Chinese people do not have loyalty to their own brands, that they all wanted Western, that they all wanted foreign. This was very, very common assumption in the 90s and 2000s. It was a very, very common assumption in the 1930s. And it simply wasn't true. I mean, back in those days, um, Carl screwed up with every kind of cigarette imaginable. Um, you know, he had uh, Lucky Strike, Chesterfield, all of those um, brands. But in the 90s, you know, it was exactly the same thing when Marlboro came in. Marlboro had been successful in every single market in the world. And yet, you know, they could not crack the Chinese market. Even something that managed to have a very good marketing campaign, the 555 brand or Sam Wu in, in China, could not crack that market in China. People still wanted their Zhongnan highs. They still wanted their Chinese cigarettes. 
arguably, you know, they knew they, they, they were familiar with the taste. There was a comfort with the taste, but there was also lots of other things associated. You know, the idea that Chairman Mao or party leaders smoked these, the ideas that these brands expressed wealth to your friends and business partners when you took them out was much stronger than the idea that a cowboy smokes these in America somewhere roaming around. So, so, you know, people were loyal to their brands. People were also very wary of pack changes. Foreign brands are always, as you know, if you go to a supermarket here, tinkering with the packaging. They're putting new writing on the packaging, the new colors, all sorts of things. Crow was like, don't do that. And we learned that again in the 90s and 2000s. Every time you tinkered with a brand, every time you tried to change the packaging a little bit, with good intention, trying to say to people, you know, you're getting 15% more here. Or, you know, well, sugar-free was never anything that really worked in China, but but like, you know, kind of this, this product is more organic or this product is, is, is slightly better or this packaging is, is, is slightly better. Um, you'd never get anywhere because people instantly wondered, is it fake? Is this the right product? Is this the product that I kind of got before? It doesn't look like the one I got before. Has someone done a product substitution and it was a constant problem. So, um, Carl concluded that, uh, it is to be hoped that manufacturers had a lot of fun out of their ventures because they didn't make much money. Um, so uh, one of the most unfortunate circumstances connected with my profession, advertising, you could say this of market research as well, is that the most valuable service I can render to a manufacturer is to keep him from throwing his money away on a vain enterprise. But it's a service for which I seldom get paid. Um, so these are, by the way, um, I'm, now, I'm now on a new mission, which is... Um, now that there's not so much foreign business in China, but lots of business in China, I want Chinese businesses to understand what Carl said, because there's so many lessons of them. So we now have, um, for the first time, a um, Chinese uh, edition of 400 million uh, customers, which came out in um, during COVID, actually. And uh, that, that also has an introduction by me to Chinese readers. And this is a biography I wrote of Carl, which is just about to come out in Chinese as well. Um, I, I wrote it really because I wanted other foreign business people like me or people doing business in China to understand what he'd had to say. Um, but um, apparently, um, so so my publishers in China tell me um, it would be useful for people in China to know these things. So quickly, I want to move on to how we get from 400 million to the next big thing that happens, which is the billion. So if you were doing business in China in the 90s, all of a sudden, it wasn't about 400 million customers. That was all gone. It was all about the magic billion. And, you know, everything went crazy on billions. Actually, I, I did do a lot of research, and there's actually a, a great academic called Tong Lam who wrote um, a brilliant book called A Passion for Facts about Chinese statistics, trying to identify where this 400 million uh, number comes from. And it was first said by a missionary in 1842. So, I mean, Carl's writing in 1937. So 400 million had already been around for a century by the time Carl uses it. Um but um, it's what Tong Lam calls enumerative imaginary. But by 1950, we get to 500 million. There's then a very funny um, argument between everyone. The American Red Cross in 1953, just before they were kicked out of China, said that the population of China in 1953 was 482 million. You better all write this down. 482 million, 869,687. Now, that is a very specific number to do. The Red Army, which hadn't yet become the People's Liberation Army, but was at that time the Red Army, said the American Red Cross doesn't know what they're talking about. The population is 492,530,000. So, so that was a slight difference of a couple of hundred thousand. And the government said the army and the Americans don't know what they're talking about. It's 600 million exactly. So there was this enormous argument about whether, you know, but nobody really had a very good idea. There was no census as such. 1965, we were up to sort of 700 million. 1980, we get to 900 million. And then 1985, which was the year I sort of started studying China, actually, we get to 1 billion. And of course, then all of these books come out about 1 billion. People cannot get enough of 1 billion. Rupert Murdoch wants to get Star TV into, a, into China because he's going to get 2 billion eyeballs, right, for Baywatch, he thinks. It never actually happened. But all of these books come out, selling to the new Chinese consumer. These are all books, none of them very there. I must admit, I also jumped in on this in, in the late 1990s. Although I would argue that ours was one billion shoppers potentially, but not really existing. But I am, I will mea culpa. I will apologize and include myself 
in the group of people who thought one million was there. This is the worst one that was ever written. It was written by an executive who worked for um, one of the companies that was trying to sell de deodorant, underarm deodorant in, in China. And he decided to write a book about his experience called Two Billion Armpits. I don't know if anyone actually ever read that. It's such a, it's such a revolting title that I'm not sure anyone ever did. But again, people were obsessed. What if you can get every single person in China to use your brand of deodorant, right? That would be a two billion armpit market, you know, a two billion eyeball market for your television station. You know, Adidas for two billion, everyone's got feet. I mean, there, there was even once I was in a meeting with an absolutely um, absurd uh, um, toothpaste company who were coming into China and they were trying to work out if there's a billion people in China, how many teeth are there in China? How many teeth? How many teeth can we potentially clean that need to have our toothpaste? And of course, you know, we don't all have the same number of teeth. So there was a very, you know, I could see us getting into some very weird mathematics on that. I remember the chewing gum com company came in and they were working out if we had a billion people chewing gum, how many sticks of gum could we sell in a year? It wouldn't be one billion. It wouldn't be two billion. If everyone eats a pack a week, it will be, you know, hundreds of billions. of. You know, it all got very, very crazy. And so we came full circle. And then in 2003, uh, this book came out, which was really the 400 million customers of the second wave. And it's still a very interesting book to read. It's by a guy called Joe Studwell, who was, who was doing a bit of business himself and writing. Now, sadly, he never copyrighted the term the China dream. Because, of course, you know, since then, there are other people in politics in China that have used this term, the China dream. And if every time the China dream was mentioned in China, he'd have got 10 fun. He'd be rather rich now, I think. And you can see the kind of image that the publishers wanted. This is the American cover in white here that shows, you know, this historical dream for the greatest untapped market on Earth. Untapped. No one's tapped the market in China yet. We haven't got there. And uh, here, of course, you know, here is. Um, Pudong looking down onto the old Shanghai Bund, the old Bund that Karl Crow's office was on, but looking from the new high rise Pudong. And Studwell had a lot of interesting things, but he was, his book again was very, very, um, opposed at the time. I remember the launch of it in Shanghai when he came there and there were people from the foreign business community who were absolutely living. They were so angry. They were like sort of China business gammon, if you know what I mean. They were so furious that someone was saying that not everyone was making money because at the time, everyone was saying they were making money in China. Um, and Joe's book uh, mentioned many things, but some of them were interesting. One was, of course, it blew the, blew the house down in terms of numbers. For instance, at that time, the United Kingdom, despite all the talk of China and all the business with China and all the effort put into China, was doing three times more business with Denmark. But as Joe said at the time, corporate CEOs don't go to sleep at night dreaming of Denmark. They go to sleep at night dreaming of being in Pudong, looking down on the Bund and so on. Right? So that was a problem. He also blew apart, which Crow had mentioned as well, the idea of trade missions. You don't really have trade missions anymore. In the old days, you know, in the sort of 90s and early 2000s, there were always trade missions. People would come to China, all the politicians would come, they would try and do a lot of business, and um, they would say that they'd signed lots and lots of deals, and we used to have this whole thing about reheating, which was we'd go through all the deals that were signed and look at the last trade mission that came and see how many of the same deals were mentioned. So, you know, like they would add them into this. So $150 billion worth is being done, but we'd say, yeah, but you know, half of that you announced last time and still haven't done, you're, you're reheating uh, deals. So, so, so trade missions now, of course, haven't quite worked. Crow always said that the only reason American politicians ever came on trade missions in the 1920s and 1930s to China was because of prohibition. They couldn't drink in America, but as soon as they got to China, they could drink. So they would arrive in Shanghai, get off the boat and go straight to a bar and drink because all the bars had been closed in, in America at that time. I mean, it was always the same with the, British politicians and, and American politicians and European politicians when they came in the 90s and 2000s. It was all about banquets. It was all about feeling very important. China was really good at making politicians feel very important. There would be the big banner. There would be the big chairs. You would get to meet someone. I mean, that's not how politicians are treated here, right? 
So they, they would like this idea that they were being given status, that they were being treated well. But it never worked. But Joe did have some good points and, and modern ones that, that, of course, wouldn't have been applicable to Crow. One very quick one I'll give because time's running out. But one very quick one I'll give is General Electric. He talked about how General Electric wanted to come into China. And they decided, they fell for the one billion trick. They decided to come in and make light bulbs. General Electric had a very successful light bulb business in America and Europe. They made the best light bulbs. If you wanted a good light bulb, you bought a GE light bulb. But in China, no one really cared about the brand of light bulb. They didn't really care. The fact that it was GE just meant it was a more expensive light bulb. They set up factories. They made these light bulbs. But Chinese people, of course, can make light bulbs. It's not a difficult thing to do. And they can make them a lot cheaper than General Electric could. So it was an absolute failure of a business. So um, the CEO at that time of um, uh, GE went away and he said, only bring me business plans for China that have the same rate of return as as you know, that, that we would accept in America or Europe. I don't want to just know there's a billion people that will buy light bulbs. There's a billion people that will buy a fluorescent tube, which was another disaster for them. It's got to be something worth it. And they went away and thought about it, and two ideas came through, which really made GE's business in China into the very successful business it still remains. And the first was medical equipment. China had this booming middle class that all wanted to go to hospitals. And every time they went to a hospital, because of the sort of way that the Chinese health service was set up, whatever you had, you just went to sort of the equivalent of A&E, basically, right? And everyone wanted uh, CAT scans and different kinds of x-rays and all the rest of it. But the local equipment really wasn't very good. General electric equipment was very, very good. And the new middle class thought getting a scan or, or, or treatment from a new kind of general electric machine was much better than getting one from an older you know, considered to be less good um, Chinese-made one. So they set up a factory in Tianjin and they started making these and they sold them all over the place. Hospitals were being built, private clinics were being built. Everyone wanted to get everything scanned. And you'll know if you've ever been to a Chinese hospital, you go in with a slightly runny nose and all of the next thing you know, you're in a thing going through again, doom, 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 and you're getting scanned all of a sudden. And then you get a bill for the scan when you go out. And somewhere along the way, you've seen a General Electric logo uh, somewhere around. And so that kind of um, uh, was very good for them. And the other thing that they got into, which was a business that would be very, very successful for them, was aircraft leasing. They looked at aircraft leasing and they said, what is China doing? And this is a play on the billion, if you like, right? What is China doing? It is expanding air travel massively. Domestic, international, its own airlines, it's building airports all over the country. People want to move around. Everyone wants to go home for New Year on a plane, not a train. You know, everyone wants to fly down to Hong Kong. Everyone wants to go abroad. And they allowed all of the local airlines to lease aircraft from Boeing, Airbus, whoever, uh, with the financing done by GE. And of course, it was an incredibly successful business. Everyone was flying around. They were selling lots of tickets. The Chinese airlines could afford to pay their bills. They did pay their bills. And it was a very, um, it, it got aircraft and air travel off the ground and it made GE a lot of money. Um, I'm not going to mention too much more, I don't think, because I've run out of time. But I did want to mention nostalgia. Nostalgia is also something that foreign business thinks about a lot and gets very nostalgic about things and always had. This book, which I put on the ultimate bookshelf, Graham Peck's Two Kinds of Time, was someone who, an American who experienced the war years and experienced China coming out of the war years and saw that there was this hunger for a new type of China. He admitted that it probably would go communist, but he wasn't so much that it was all about lots and lots of people wanting to be Marxists. It was more about who was going to give you what you wanted. And he shows here, you know, this young chap with this old type loom thinking to himself, you know, I want a factory. I want a machine. And I think Peck was really ahead of his time as a foreigner in understanding that it was that level of aspiration. It wasn't about adherence to Marxist-Leninist theory. That was just the kind of system that would get you to eventually the opportunity. Um, to have to, to, to go from a loom to a factory. And of course, it took a long time, but by the kind of 1980s and, and into the 1990s, the growth of Shenzhen, Guangdong, and, and the whole kind of um, boom in, 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 in the Dungist uh, era kind of happened. He drew a lot of things when he went around. Um, you can read that yourself. We will never uh, forget and we will never fail. 
Um, and then he shows that shortly afterwards, that logo was still there, but everything got back to business after the war. There was resolution during the war. There was a determination to win, of course, against the Japanese. But then it got back to it and up go the um, advertising hoardings, getting business back and going. Come and buy your cigarettes. I know cigarettes are very unpolitically correct now, but, th but they were um, at the time a major sort of product and an advertising. And so he looks at that. So this, I think... Um, Nostalgia, an interesting one as a final point, is um, I think nostalgia is an interesting one both for foreigners, but also for the Chinese. I noticed when I was, the last book that I did that was published in Chinese, I was there in late 2019, just before the world changed. And um, I kind of um, was was talking to people. It was a book about gangsters in Shanghai in the 1930s, right? But everyone that I was talking to, all the journalists were very young, Chinese journalists, and they were all had got the same uh, uh, CV resume of mine from um, from the publishers, and um, they were all focused very much on um, the fact that I'd been in the Shanghai in the 90s and was writing about the Shanghai in the 30s. And they all it was a very interesting moment because they were all asked the same question, although they didn't know each other at all. And they all wanted to know about what was Shanghai like in the 90s under Jiang Zemin. What was it like? Was it this? what they described as, or now saw nostalgically as a golden era in, in, in Shanghai that, that they'd heard about, that where everything had seemed possible, which was sort of true at that time. But, you know, they, they saw this era as um, a, a thing that they looked back on with a certain nostalgia. And I hadn't really thought about it at that time because it was just a part of the world, part of the life that I lived through. But um, they were looking at it this time that they didn't quite know, couldn't quite reach where they had either been very very young or perhaps not even born yet and um they were um, looking at this nostalgically so we're not the only ones that indulge um in a little bit of uh, nostalgia and i think we saw that again it, i thought of that again when jung zemin died and and the sort of so much that i saw online about people talking about that time of jung zemin and how how they sort of remembered it so i think this last picture, which comes from Carl's 400 million customers, uh, which, which has the quote under it in the book. And it's obviously uh, one of his uh, staff drawing one of these adverts for the modern Shanghai woman. Um, and he says, we always redraw the picture in China. And I think that that's very the thought I would leave you with and, and the thought that comes through from these books as well that I've put on the shelf which are, you know, we always constantly think again and again of China. The way we thought of China in the 90s when we went there has changed to the 2000s. And thinking about it now as business gets going and we do different businesses in a very different relationship with China, um, we once again are redrawing the picture and trying to understand. But if we have our collective memory of what we did before, we hopefully won't, as we did in the 90s and 2000s, make all the same mistakes again, which, you know, I made in the 2000s that my grandfather made in the 30s, not that my grandfather ever went to China, but you know you know what I mean, 30s. And, uh, you know, presumably my kids, if they go to China now, will make those mistakes if they don't read these books. So collective memory is very important and something that we've lacked in business in China. 